<clears throat> nice to see you here. Warm welcome to the How Hebel and Mover. Warm welcome to Berlinale Talents. Um, as we've said several times already, but I'm very proud to just repeat it again. So the Talents family is quite big. So in total, it's 8,000 people who have been in the program over many, many, many years. And uh, those people are traveling the world. Those films are made and coming back to Berlin every now and then. Here it's around 90 films this year, which were made with the involvement of Berlinale Talents alumni. We're happy about that. But of course, the family is bigger. And uh, if someone is around, we say, oh, well, probably you should come back and make full circle. And today we have someone here coming uh, who actually has been at Berlinale Talents when it was still called Berlinale Talent Campus. Um, it was in 2005, quite a while ago in the House of World Cultures. But we kept in touch and uh, we also kept uh, in the same spirit, I guess. And we will talk about this today um, and to do this, Without any further ado, I would like to introduce you to the moderator of today, which is Jenny Tilka. Hello, good to see you all. I have nothing to say except that we have a wonderful guest today that we're going to talk about things like how to fail better and other, many other subjects that you maybe also have experienced. So please welcome the wonderful director, David Lowry. Thank you. How nice they opened the bottles already for us. That's very kind. So Do some product placement. Just yeah. and, no, no, that's, that wasn't the reason. I didn't mention that because of that. I won't, I won't say the name, but on the other hand, it's a sponsor, I think. So, yeah. And refreshing. <laughs> okay, that's enough now with this. Um, <laughs> So David, um, it's, uh, I'm, I was very pleased meeting you because of course I know your work, maybe you know his work too, maybe you have seen A Ghost Story, I hope you have, it's a wonderful film, yeah. Thank you. And of course it's, um, yeah, you all remember, remember Casey Affleck standing in this film underneath this <laughs> kind of cheat and you didn't know if it was him or not but still it was really really touching and and a great film and i also saw pete's dragon that i knew from the 80s under the name of elliot the schmunzel monster maybe one, one or the other of you knows the german version too but pete's dragon was great too and i saw your new film too the old man and the gun which is the last role that robert redford ever took uh, that what that's what he said so um it's gonna be coming out very soon yeah i think it? it opens in a few weeks here yeah so you're gonna can see it, uh, this film too and now we would like to talk about uh, um, how to fail better. But um, when we contacted you, or when you were contacted by Talents, you um, uh, had a kind of idea of talking about music because you said music has got a lot to do with your work, with your inspiration, and where you get your inspiration from. And you sent a wonderful playlist <laughs> that I really <laughs> like to read. And we're going to listen to some of the songs today, which is an interesting experience, sitting there in a in light room, <laughs> listening to music, <laughs> not talking, but I'm looking forward to that. Mm. Before we listen to the first song, um, and I chose from your list PJ Harvey, because I understood that she is kind of inspirational for you, mm -hmm. your music. Can you say something about that? I. Well, there's a lot to say. I could go on and on about it, but there's, you know, I discovered her, you know, oh gosh, probably when I was in high school, vis-a-vis mm -hmm. uh, -vis Nick Cave, um, on some of, you know, uh, his albums, she did, she would do duets with him like, early on, and just really loved her and started listening to all of her music, and, and I feel like there's been different albums of hers that have like meant different things to me in my life. Like White Chalk, for example, was an album that came out in a very difficult time in my life. And I listened to that album over and over and over again. I feel like I got through that period. I think it was in 2007 because of that record. Um, and then I think the song we're listening to today, the movie that I'm working on right now that we're going to begin shooting very soon, I, I don't know what the music is going to be just yet. But there was one song that just it felt right, and, and so I put it on a playlist of, of songs I gave to the actors. And it's the only, I, I can imagine it being in the movie. I imagine when I do the first cut of the movie, I'll use the song in it, and whether or not it makes it to the final film, I so don't you, know. But. So you, you give playlists to your actors always at every film? 
Not always, but often I do. Like, I'll, I'll have music that just feels right to me, um, and sometimes it's worth sharing, sometimes it's not. Sometimes I don't think it'll actually add much. But with the film that we're making now, I just wanted to kind of communicate the feeling that I had. And the script, you know, can be interpreted in all sorts of different ways, but I felt that if I shared some of this music that I was listening to while I was writing it, or that just reminded me of the feelings that I had while I was writing it or thinking about it, it might help us all get a little bit closer to being on the same page. We must maybe um, say that this film is about uh, is a medieval, is set in the medieval times, so P.J. Harvey wouldn't be the first thing that comes to my mind. <laughs> but still, I know what you mean. Yeah, and, and, it fits. Uh, it's, there's, there's some, yeah. it's always some je ne sais quoi that just makes yeah. it... I could listen to the lyrics of this song that we're about to, to listen mm -hmm. to, and maybe I'd have to stretch a little bit to make it fit to the themes of the film itself, but there's something about the quality of the song, the, the emotions that I get from it that really feel accurate to what we're trying to capture. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm someone that doesn't pay that much attention to lyrics. It's really mm -hmm. bad. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't hear words. I hear sounds and I hear feelings. Mm -hmm. And I can listen to a song a million times and yet never quite know what mm -hmm. the words say. But I know it by heart at the same time. So this is one of those. I mean, I know all the lyrics to the song and I can figure out ways to like say, well, this, this line corresponds to this idea in the script. but. Mm -hmm. It's more than that. Like that'd be reductive for me to do that. It's more about the feeling you get from it. It's interesting that you say that that you're not listening to lyrics because I always uh, assumed that everybody who is a native speaker in English would also would always uh, know what people sing about. Because I had I remember the times when I couldn't speak English at all and I was a Beatles fan and I didn't know what they were singing about. It was a different kind of quality I, I found in the music. And sometimes I think it's it's. Uh, it was better when I didn't know what Can they were I, singing about. I'll, let me segue for one second. <laughs> I, don't pay Beatles, attention, I don't pay attention to words ever. It doesn't matter. Like right now, I'm very what? focused. I'm listening to what you're telling me. I hope but so. <laughs> I was, you know, six months ago at home, I put on a movie and that I'd rented from iTunes. And it was, um, I can't remember which movie it was, but it was, it was, I think it was French or perhaps Spanish. And... I watch it for like the first 20 minutes, and then my wife comes in and she's like, why didn't you turn the subtitles on? And I hadn't even noticed that I hadn't, I was just watching the film. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess I'm not, like I wasn't, under, I wasn't understanding what the characters were saying, um, but I was still following the movie. And I have a bad habit of doing that. Like, like I will just like kind of like drift off when dialogue is occurring. I love writing dialogue, and I, my movies have plenty of dialogue in them, but that's never really that important to me. And when I'm watching a movie, It's also, as much as I love a well-crafted monologue or like really, you know, I love, you know, reading, you know, dialogue that's been written well, I still, that's not the most important thing to me. I still sort of like zone out a little bit and other things start to emerge. They start to, you know, I start paying attention to other things in the film. And so I, it's a bad habit of mine. You know, I value <laughs> the dialogue in films, but I still will often you know, just kind of drift away from that and focus on other things. And I've, you know, I've learned that's just something I do and I'm not trying to fix it about myself anymore. <laughs> It's just part of the way I process things. I absolutely agree with you. As a curator, I'm watching like 800 films from different countries and I, of course, I read the subtitles, but I think the body language is, uh, is universal in a way. And they say that in speeches, for example, after a few minutes, you don't listen to the uh, content anymore you, because you, you saw already from the body language if you it's got true the, or yeah. not. So this you is, understand. But now... Let's listen to, or not listen to, <laughs> to the lyrics of P.J. Harvey's song, Desperate Kingdom of Love. Can we, please? Thank you, Polly Jean. Um, so I'm sorry for asking this typical journalist question, but is your, your new film about love, about lost love? Because that's what it's, I thought. It's not, <laughs> not in a romantic sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's elements of that, but I think all of my movies wind up being about my movies all wind up being rather romantic, mm. even though they never are intended to be such when I first set out to make them. And this isn't a love story between two people. Mm. It's, a, it's, it's something different, but, but love runs through it. Mm. And I don't know exactly how just yet. <laughs> I'll figure that out as we're making it. Mm. But I, even just sitting here listening to that right now, I think about how you know, in five weeks we're gonna be on set shooting this thing and it's gonna be crazy and hectic and making a million decisions every hour as you do when you're making a film. And it's always important to just sort of like find ways to refocus. And sometimes it's breathing and sometimes it's just finding, you know, a little detail to latch onto. And other times it's just remembering that a song like that, which is just one 
wonderful woman and a guitar and, and some beautiful words can encapsulate what you're trying to do, even though you're surrounded by all these other people trying to do the same thing. And so it's nice for me to just sit there right now and listen to that and think forward to the future when I'm going to be needing to listen to that song again <laughs> and, and trying to just keep track of what it is that I'm after, even though I can't put it into words just yet. So it's also a kind of escapism in a way if you go into the song uh, that gives, that calms you, you know, to have a little space. Definitely, definitely, especially if it's a song that communicates to you something intangible. Mm -hmm. You know, most music that I listen to makes me feel a certain way and I can't always put a finger on why or what it is. Sometimes it's a very direct correlation, but other times you're just, there is just a, a harmony between you know, your own emotional being and whatever the artist was feeling when they were creating that song and they just are perfectly in sync. And when a song feels like what you want your movie to feel like, it's just one of those nice reminders that all of the humdrum, you know, bells and whistles that come along with film production ultimately are in service of trying to capture an emotion mm -hmm. that in a piece of music can be captured very quickly and efficiently. and and simply, and that we are after that same, you know, efficiency as artists. We're after that same degree of simplicity of trying to just cut through everything to deliver that harmonic emotion. What would you do if somebody, some of your actors or actresses would say, you gave me this PJ Harvey song, I hate it, <laughs> it's terrible. What would you uh, do then? That's a good question. I hope they would tell me before we got to set. Have you, have you heard this playlist of David? It's terrible. I really hope. I remember when we made, when I first worked with Rooney Mara, I sent her a playlist and um, later we talked about it. And I was like, oh, so what do you think about the song? She's like, oh, they're fine, but I got my own. And, <laughs> fresh, and her songs were very yeah, good too. She fresh had, people. Yeah, she, uh, she reminded me how good the Twilight to Breaking Dawn soundtrack is. That's, yeah, it's an incredible yeah, soundtrack. Actually, it is. You wouldn't it's believe it, but it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't laugh. It's <laughs> really good. It's a really good soundtrack. Even the first movie is not as bad as some people think. But um, let's talk about really. We could talk about Twilight yeah, more if you would. Yeah, we, yeah. I, I'm. I'm a <laughs> I'm an expert. I wouldn't say a fan, but I'm an expert. Um, but let's talk about touching uh, songs once again. Uh, are there? Do you know any songs that really can make you cry? There are songs in my life that I've heard at a specific time that have brought me to the verge of tears or to had made me cry. Live music will do it more. Mm -hmm. um, Really live music, like live rock and roll bands, for example? No, like, I, I don't go to that many concerts. I prefer, mm -hmm. like, my ideal show would be to be in a room like this where I'm sitting down and can have a contemplative experience with the artist performing on stage. So m when I go see live music, it's usually artists who will play in venues where you can sit down. I haven't been to, like, a metal show in a long time, for example, um, although that moves you in a different way. Um, but... I have trouble getting in touch with my emotions. It's something that I've just always had, and I don't, it's part of the, just the way I was raised, and, and I, I find music can bring me to an emotional state more quickly, but it's never just one song. Like, there's never a song that I will listen to and, like, think, okay, I need to, I'm like, I'm feeling pretty closed off. I need to shed a tear. What, what, what's my direct ticket to, to you know, crying. Like, I, I never just, like, have a song that will make that happen, but there will be circumstances that occur where a song's playing at just the right time that will bring out an unexpected well of emotion. And when that happens, I can usually tap back into that. And most of the songs we're probably going to listen to today fall into that category. But there's also unexpected ones. You know, there's, there's, you know, I love pop music, and every now and then there'll be a pop song that really just, like... Yeah. They are made for make you cry. Yeah, yeah, and they, they, but they really touch me in a profound way. I mean, in... In um, a ghost story, Kesha is in that film, and she mm -hmm. wrote a song for us for it, and it's because I really love her. Mm -hmm. But her new album, like, so there's songs on that that really get me in an emotional way, and I, I, uh, you know, I love all of her fun dance tracks too. But there's every now and then, like, there's something that will just really get me. I will always cry when I listen to "Oh to Billy Joe" by Bobby Gentry. I don't know why it's, it's. I think it's a harmonic thing. I think it's because of the, uh, um, the harmonic way mm -hmm. it's made. And I always cry when I listen to um, uh, these old uh, left-wing um, squatted houses, Tonsteine Scherben uh, songs, which is a German band, because I, it touches me very much how much they 
thought that could change the world with music. And that's uh, whenever I listen to music like this, I have to, I cry because it's, I don't know, it's so nice that you people believe that. Yeah, and you feel that idealism coming yeah, through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's where I cry the most. Um, but we won't listen to it today. <laughs> <laughs> On your playlist, there were lots of female musicians. Um, it was like more than a quota. We're talking about the quota all the time. It was more than 50% female musicians. Um, is it accidentally or is it that mus uh, female voices or female yeah, songwriting, whatever, touching you in a... Yeah, I guess it's a, it was accidental, um, but it's true. I mean, I, I love, you know, all the music that I love the most is probably female musicians. And the same goes for, like, novel. Like, I love... Well, someone pointed out the other day that all my favorite novelists are female, so... Why is that? Um, I have not analyzed why I respond to it more. I try to avoid self-analyzation to a certain degree, but there is a... I don't know. I got something that that speaks to me about that perspective, and I, I, whether it's just like the the harmonics of a of a woman's voice that I re resonates with me more than a, a man's. Um, I also like you know find that you know if you've seen my movies, like I usually kind of like give deference to the female characters in them, even if they're often about male protagonists. I kind of like start to like pay more attention to the to the women in my films, and, and that's a perspective that I am just more drawn to. And I fe keep finding myself making these movies with male protagonists, and I keep, as I'm making the movie, being like, oh, why did I make the movie about this guy? I'm more focused on, on everyone else in the film. And um, so I, I haven't, you know, dug too deeply into that, but it is something, you know, I am very drawn to. and. It goes back to probably just like how attached I was to my mother growing up. You know, it's like it could be as reductive as that. It could be as as, as non-reductive as saying all of the you know the people in my life who have influenced me the most and who have whose work has illuminated things have been women. Um, but it's a perspective that I am. The aesthetics, the female aesthetic, is something I'm very interested in too. It's like it's I'm far more interested in that than than, than the male aesthetic. So it's it's something that I. Um, I keep going back to. And your new film is also with a male protagonist, then, or with? Yeah, there is. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a, it's same deal. Like I, I realized that after I writing, I was like, oh man, I did it again. <laughs> like it's a male protagonist, it's a male. but um, he is completely a passive character, and he's catalyzed by all the women in the film. And mm -hmm. so there's certainly, I'm sur sure, something um, autobiographical about that fact. The fact that I keep making movies that do that. Before we talk about uh, rhythm in film, because of course you all know that uh, editing is the rhythm giver, or oh, I don't know the, the English word for a film, so it's much uh, very important. We should see uh, a little part of um, an excerpt of Ghost Story. There's a um, scene that I like very much because I, s I think it really symbolizes the rhythm thing, that is the communication between the ghost and another ghost. For those of you who haven't seen it, um, um, this ghost is living in a ho this house for a long time. He has to stay there. and he finds out that there's another ghost <laughs> in the neighbor, uh, in, the, in the house uh, next to him, and they start to, <laughs> in a way, talk to each other. Maybe we could see this. I see that I think it's a second uh, excerpt from Ghost Story that you have. Please. I haven't no. seen the movie since we finished editing really? it, so but it's a... I nice think reminder. It's, it's not accidental that, uh, that the chords in the music scene are the beginning of Stairway to Heaven, isn't it? Or is it accidentally? Is this the first chords? Ooh, that would be an accident. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think that he made it bad. Probably he... Yeah, I don't think that was intentional, but maybe. I'll have to ask Daniel. <laughs> Yeah, but um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's I very like very much the fact that you've given us this and subtitles for the ghost communication. Who was who's playing the other ghost, by the way? Me. Really? Yeah. Ah. That was my cameo. Very good acting. That's the first time I've ever done a cameo in my own movies. <laughs> um, Is that known? I mean, do everybody know? Does I'm sure that's, know it's out there. I've, I've mentioned it. It's it's it, the information's floating around out there. But okay, what a pity. I um, <laughs> I wanted to you know know how uncomfortable that costume was, so I. Just wanted to, mm. I volunteered to do it. Um, <laughs> but that was um, that was a scene that in the script was just the wave, like it ended there, and 
the idea was just to have like a little moment that was kind of humorous, like mm -hmm. a little pocket of mm -hmm. humor amongst mm -hmm. all of the other feelings that were going through that section of the movie. Because I thought it just the idea of two ghosts waving each other made me laugh. So mm -hmm. we, you know, we, we filmed it and the structure of it, as you see, it's like all these like long zooms in and the idea was that we do all this build up, these long zooms and then we'd punctuate it with a wave, mm -hmm. and then the scene would be over, and the ghost would never be seen again, um, that na the neighbor ghost. And so we shot it that way, and then as I was editing it, I just wanted more of it. Like, I didn't want that scene to end with the wave. It wasn't enough. And I realized that at that point in the movie, this character, this ghost, had been unable to communicate with anybody for roughly, I want to say, like 20, 25 minutes maybe. Um, and it was so satisfying just to see a connection of any sort that I just wanted to live in that moment for a little longer. And we had enough footage that I just started cutting, you know, shot, reverse shot, and, and thought, you know, I kind of started writing dialogue and subtitles almost as a joke. I didn't know if I could get away with it, and I showed it to... Um, a couple of my, my producing partners, and they were like, no, that works, that really works. Um, and it just felt, you know, just on the right side of like, it, it was kind of goofy, but just enough, you know, that it, it didn't break the mood of the movie in that moment. And also, it turned what was initially supposed to be a really funny scene to something that was really, really sad, which kept happening over the course of the film. You know, there was so much in this movie that was, when I was writing it, when I was writing the script, I just thought, well, this will just be funny. It'll be a funny sight gag, um, and there's lots of pathos and emotion, but it's okay to have like some laugh out loud moments too. And those laugh out loud moments just kept getting sadder and sadder. <laughs> um, and, uh, and this was one of them. And then, we, and, then, and then we went back and shot more material with the neighbor ghost again and had, um, had her show up. We, we called her the grandma ghost because she was wearing a floral printed bed sheet. And that kind of like gave us the, gave me the idea for what the dialogue would be. Like she's waiting for her grandchildren to come visit her and they never do and so. Um, uh, for me, it's kind of the climax, uh, not of the film, but in this um, in a kind of emotional understanding moment because in this, uh, in this little dialogue where the ghost says, I can't remember who I'm, uh, whom I'm waiting for. And this is so sad that somebody is waiting so long that uh, he forgets. Uh, why he's there, that makes uh, a lot of sense uh, to me for this film, so I really like this. We scene. definitely talked about that when we were shooting it, just like there's a point later in the movie where he's sitting in the kitchen, um, and we had a costume that was meant to look like it had been around for centuries at that point, and he's just sitting still, and and we were like talking about like how the idea there is that he has no idea who he is anymore, and that he has forgotten, and... Um, and there's not many ways you can play that, you know, when you're under that sheet. You can't, like, say, like, well, my intention in this scene is that I have completely forgotten who I am. But somehow just talking about those things kind of created an atmosphere on set that I think did were, was conducive, not only to, like, the performance, but also to just the way in which we shot it, the language we used to shoot those scenes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the music in this film and also in other films uh, uh, that you made is, is uh, made by Daniel Hart. Yeah. Um, and this music especially, I like it very much because, as I said, about rhythm. We have this rhythm of editing uh, in the first part of the scene where they say hi and, and shot and, and contra shot, and then the music kind of uh, kind of takes it on and, and just goes into chords, and before it was just uh, a layer of something mm -hmm. or, or one, one tone. So maybe you can say something more about, about uh, film music. What has film music to do for you, or what is it normally should add to a film? You know... It's something that I'm, that I'm struggling with because I find, like I said earlier, that I have a hard time getting in touch with my own emotions. And music is a, a very, there's an efficacy to music that just like I get there right away. Like music make me, makes me feel things. Even if it doesn't make me cry necessarily, it makes me feel. And when I'm making these films, you know, I have this idealistic, viewpoint from the beginning that I'll make a movie that will function so perfectly that the emotions will come through and it won't need any music. That they'll just so, so you think it's for the emotions only? It's for the, yeah, and, well, not necessarily, but that's where it starts. And so then as I get, you know, as I work on the film, I lose confidence. Like, I've seen the movie too many times and I'm editing it. I start to get um, numb to whatever emotional quality the movie might have 
And then when I put music to it, I feel emotions again. And I can get carried away with it. I'll start putting lots of music in because I like, get so excited by just being able to feel something from the films again. And often the movies do need that music. They often have, um, you know, they're by design, they're intended to have music in certain sequences. Like most, much of a ghost story, the music was, that is in there was, we intended it to be there while we were shooting even. But I can get carried away with it too. I can put in too much music because I just get so addicted to feeling while I'm watching the film. And, um, and so that's usually a process. Like I usually have a cut that has just far too much music and I sit on it for a month or two and then I start trying to peel it back out. And even now I'll watch you know, clips from my old films and I haven't seen a single movie that I've made in its entirety since finishing them. Like I, as soon as I finish post-production, I never watch them again, but I'll see clips every now and then and, uh, and think like, oh, we could have gotten away without music there, it would have been fine. <laughs> but I always thought that, me, that the film should function totally and perfectly well without music. That's true, and, uh, and when I do, when I'm editing, we don't put temp score in until we have a good cut that works. Like, I want to be able to watch the movie and have it function as a film, and then if we need to put temp score in, like, for example, with Pete's Dragon, you go through this process of doing studio screenings and showing it to test audiences, and the score is not done yet, so you have to put a temp score in there. But before doing that, I made sure the movie worked on its own terms, um, without any music and still felt emotional. And I do that with everything. Like I always want the movie to completely function without music so that it doesn't become a crutch from day one. It's like, you know, if you were to show me like a scene that I shot two days after I shot it and, and like, if my editor like puts Tim's score there, I'll just start thinking about it. I'll let that score define it. And I, I need the material to define itself before I can let music do its magic. Have you seen, by the way, the last Planet of the Apes film? <laughs> I have. Um, the one where there's almost all the film is a silent movie. Yeah, it's that was si sign language. That was like one of the things I loved about it was like the first yeah. hour and a half yeah. is just it's like a concert apes and, yeah. and, and subtitles. You see ape sign it's, language, it's, and it's interesting what it's they say. pretty revolutionary. Yeah, and then you listen to the wonderful score by Michael Cimonetti or something. Somebody, Jacano. Yeah, I, I don't know Italian name, yes. a Hollywood guy who does big things, but this music score is like new music. I really love it. It's, yeah, it's wonderful. it was really that, that was yeah. the the thing I took away most from that film. It was yeah, like this exactly. is a, incredible. Yeah. It's like Lawrence of Arabia with apes and no dialogue. Yeah, yeah. if you get if, if you're used to the to this thing that the apes are strange, then it's okay yeah. to, to see that. Um, but uh, um, talking about uh, m film music that uh, inspired you also, or that you like, because you put some things on your playlist too, and, and I found it very interesting that you put Hans Zimmer and Johnny Greenwood on this playlist, because for me, they're like the opposite <laughs> sides. They of, are, of they the are thing. the yeah. I love Johnny Greenwood. I, 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 I find his music in films as, uh, as uh, an own language, you know, it's like listening to a concert. You don't need the film. I like watching the Anderson films with his music, but I can also listen only to the music, and Hans Zimmer is the opposite in a way. Very much, mm. except with one exception, I think, <laughs> or a couple yeah. exceptions. Yeah, um, so maybe let's, before we talk about that, talk about, uh, uh, listen to Johnny Greenwood uh, the, from Phantom Thread, from the last film that he um, did yeah. music for, a piece of, uh, yeah, a piece of music by Johnny Greenwood. He's a Radiohead guitar, guitar player, if, some, if you don't know, and he's also a wonderful composer, and it's called Alma. Wonderful, isn't it? Oh. I mean, that's one of those yeah. pieces of music that can yeah. get you to that place really yeah. quickly. It's, Absolutely. I feel like, one of the most romantic pieces of music I've ever written, and yet it's so, it's got those, those questions in it, yeah. those, those minor chords that yeah. just, you know, illuminate the complexity yeah. of, of feeling, of, of feeling that you can have towards someone mm -hmm. else. And the scene that that plays in in the movie, I almost wonder... I, I don't know this to be true at all, but I can only Im I, I imagine mm. that this piece was written not for that scene, and then, he, and then in the editing that they put it in there. I don't there. know. I know that um, uh, 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 there will be blood. He didn't write the stuff for the for the film. Yeah. I couldn't believe it because it was so extremely well placed there, and I couldn't believe it. But I read that he didn't write this music for for the film. But I mean, uh, um, he didn't train as a composer. Any, mm -hmm. uh, uh, too, he was just he's a 
not just, but he's a guitar player yeah. who's interested in all kinds of music. And I think he now knows sometimes some things yes. about composing and about orchestral uh, things. Um, but uh, let's say that for, for this film, uh, um, Phantom Thread, of course, the rest of the music, the soundtrack is also very great. Um, the th pieces that are in there, the songs that are in there, like classical songs. I think you never take uh, uh, soundtrack songs into your films, don't you? You always have this kind of score that is made by music, or do you have a, a lot of soundtracks? Because I can't remember. The, at the moment. You mean like in terms of like, yeah, like, like, like needle like drops? Songs, or? Yeah, yeah, real songs. Um, I think that um, Old Man and the Gun was the first time I did that. I did it a little bit in Pete's Dragon. I, I, Old Man and the Gun, you're right. There are some songs. Oh, Pete's Dragon had a few mm -hmm. that were really important to me. Like some of my favorite moments in that movie. I did go through recently and make a, I had to cut 10 minutes out of it so they could show it on TV. And mm -hmm. rather than, I, just, I said I'd do it myself. And, I, mm -hmm. and there's all these sequences in that, in that movie where characters are just, driving and listening to music or mm. things like their songs in it and I was like I can't cut those out those are the mm -hmm. best parts of the movie um, it was a real I mean not to take too much of a detour but there's a sequence in that movie where the characters like Bryce Dallas Howard and the little boy are, mm. and, and are driving and uh, and when we were driving we we're shooting that scene mm. I remember that uh, Bryce asked me like what what's the emotional quality of it? And I was like, well, I'm just gonna put some music on and just like react to that, mm -hmm. let that guide you. Mm -hmm. And so we played So Long Marianne, the mm -hmm. Leonard Cohen song as they were driving. Um, and then we were recording sound. So of course it was like in the dailies and it wound up in the edit. And there's a, came a point in the edit where we were like, okay, we need to cut like five minutes out of this movie. It's just feeling a little draggy. And of mm -hmm. course, like one option was like, there's a, two minute sequence or a minute and a half where the characters are just driving somewhere and listening to Leonard Cohen, that's an easy, that's a gimme. We should take that out. It doesn't affect the plot. And we took it out and the movie just fell flat on its face. It just didn't work. It needed that moment where these characters are just driving and listening to a song. I hope that you have checked the rights then already if you need it. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. We, uh, <laughs> that's one of the nice things about making a Disney movie is you can afford Leonard Cohen songs. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, <laughs> but try <the>, Beatles. <laughs> but the but the old man, the gun was the first movie I've made that has, mm. you know, it has songs in it, mm. and it and mm. uh, songs that people know aside from Pete's Dragon, and that's that was a um, a conscious choice. Like that movie felt like the type of movie that needed to have. There's a great pleasure when you hear a song that you know well in a movie being utilized in a certain way. It just brings all sorts of associations to it, and you just feel you know, you bring all sorts of feelings that you already have with that song because you know it so well. And that's why, you know, so many great movie moments are scored by pop songs because they just, they bring that rush. And, this, and that movie needed a little bit of that. Mm. Yes, of course, the song always brings something with it because it has already... Uh, yeah, it's already, it's got its yeah, own life. Yeah. You have your own life with it. But since uh, we are still talking about how to fail better, um, <laughs> and I, I don't find so much failing in, in uh, but, but still, um, for example, if you wouldn't uh, be able to afford uh, Leonard Cohen or whatever, what, what, what do you do if it doesn't, if you don't have the money? Uh, well, what we've done in every movie is, up until Old Man the Gun, and, not, and including Pete's Dragon, in fact, is um, we write our own music. And so, for example, in... That sound alike, like something else then. Yeah, we just like say, we, let's, we have so many talented musician friends. And, and so I'll think, like, let's just, you know, write a song that, that doesn't sound... We're not trying to carbon co make a carbon copy of something, but we want to evoke a feeling. Mm -hmm. So, for example, again, to use Pete's Dragon, um, we had a scene where the rough cut was scored with the song from Inside Lewin Davis, Fare Thee Well, which was just a great song. Mm -hmm. And it fit the movie perfectly. And sort of like, I think it was the first scene we cut together and we used that song to sort of like define what the tone of the movie would be, what its, what its feeling would be. And I didn't want to use, I, you know, we, we could have tried to license it, but that song belongs to the Coen Brothers movie. It's not, they didn't write it, but still that song is for that movie. And so, I just had um, my uh, co-writer, Toby Halbrooks, he's a musician, and, he, and we know a lot of musicians, and so he just wrote another song um, with some other friends of ours that wasn't similar to that, but yet captured the same sort of feeling, had the, evoked the same qualities. And we've done that for every movie, um, including, um, including Old Man the Gun, even though that has a lot of needle drops in it from songs we know well, there's still some other songs in there that are original and are written to sound like songs of the era or of the time. Ain't the Body Saints has a lot of songs on the radio and those are always songs that we just write for the film. Um, 
and uh, and just try to capture a quality that we're looking for. And you know, the benefit of it is it's we get to employ our friends, we get to employ our you know all the musicians we know, and um, create a new song. And also, they generally are a little bit cheaper than Leonard Cohen songs. Yes, and I still want to. Um have this subject of, of money a little bit in, in our mind. I mean, um, you had, before you did Pete's Dragon, you did smaller films. Uh, yeah, I think Ain't Them Body Saints was before, um, mm -hmm. and some short films, and then you got Pete's Dragon, and now you're having this Disney film with Rod Redford. Were you ever afraid of the kind of responsibility and money and, and uh, a structure that was given you uh, to you and, and when you did these films? I, I wasn't. Like, that one, I, sh I maybe I should have, but I really felt like I knew how to make it. You know, I knew how to use that money. I knew how to utilize the means that were given to me. I find, you know, we all want to make movies and we've all seen a lot of movies and we want to be able to make movies a certain way. And the benefit of having a budget that you get when you make a Disney movie is like you're finally able to like do those things that you've always dreamed of that maybe you wouldn't have been able to afford before. Which isn't to say that the movies that I made prior were compromised, or I mean, there were things we couldn't do because we didn't have the money for it. But it's 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 not daunting, you know. You have a techno crane for the first time in your career, and it's like great. Now I can finally do those crane shots that I've always wanted to do. Maybe the other movies didn't need crane shots, but yes. at the same time, in the back of your head, you're like, it'd be really cool to do something on a techno crane. Are crane shots so important for movies? <laughs> certain, I mean, sometimes, I mean, to get really technical, I use cranes instead of like. If, if you have a dolly shot that is a certain type of dolly shot, sometimes it's easier to use a telescopic crane to get that, and you can't always afford those. But, you know, for example, on Old Man the Gun, we had a techno crane, not for big, high, wide crane shots, but to just move the camera a certain way on a lateral path. Um, and it's nice when you're able to finally able to use those tools. So it's not daunting. It's really just yeah. you, you, as a filmmaker, feel like, you know, you've been hired for a reason. <laughs> they, they, they definitely have hired you because they want you to make the movie the way you would make it. And, um, and so the weight of the budget is mm. not something that, that is a pressure. Mm. I was more terrified on a ghost story, which was $150,000, mm. because it was my money and my friend's money. We, pay, we paid for it ourselves, and I didn't mm. want... I was okay, like, if I lose all my money on this movie, it's fine. But, like, my friends who also put money in, I was like, this is a big risk. Like, this mm. movie could fall flat on its face, and we would all be, you know, hurting because we, we can't afford to make movies all the time like that. I'm glad to hear that you say the weight of the money is not really worrying you, and it's, of course it's great, but, and I don't know what you can say about that, but still, uh, isn't, doesn't the weight of the money come with a certain kind of, of, uh, 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 kind of influen uh, influential things that Disney, as a big company, tries to have with you? Or is, is, aren't they also, I don't know, because they give you, give you so much money, or not only Disney, but you know, any production company who, is, uh, who has... Yeah, the there's definitely like that feeling of responsibility. And you want to be responsible with, with that. But Pete's Dragon was a great experience because I wanted to make a Disney movie. I didn't want to go in there and make a covert like art film. There's like it's definitely an artful movie, and I'm, it's one of the movies I'm most proud of. But I wanted to make a classic Disney movie, and so there was never a point where I felt like the process that came with that was going to hurt the movie. You know, there's definitely, you do test screenings, you get audience response, you try out different things. All those things are part of the process. But at the end of the day, because of what I set out to do is very pure, the first cut that I turned in is pretty close to the theatrical cut, and it's just a little bit shorter. Um, and, and that's because I wanted to make a Disney movie. When I'm making something like Old Man the Gun, there is a little bit more pressure, because, like, on the one hand, you know, I could have made just a very lighthearted caper movie um, that is closer to Ocean's Eleven that would have probably been a bigger box office hit. But that's not what I wanted to do, nor could I, I couldn't do that. Like, I just didn't have that in myself. And so I was doing something different. And you do have to, like, lay awake at night sometimes and just think, like, am I the best person for this job? Am I wasting someone's money to doing this? Because I'm not making the, the most straightforward version of this, this tale. And that's something that it just, again, it comes, it's, it's, it's responsibility, just knowing like that intrinsically you hopefully know how to make a good movie and that you're going to make the best movie you can and that the people who have hired you or that are paying for it are doing so because they want you to do that. They want you to make 
I mean, I'm sure they'd love it if it was the most commercial movie of all time because it would be just like they'd breathe easy. But at the same time, I think there would be a disappointment in that because you took the easier route. And so you just have to trust the fact that you've been given the opportunity to make this movie because people believe that you can do it your way and they want to see how you would do it. Sounds like you're somebody who really trusts uh, in humanity or in other people, you know. It sounds like you really, if, because you, we were, we were t trying to talk about trial and errors and mistakes, but it sounds like um, you believe if, you, if somebody says you, you can do it, you just, okay, you, you think, okay, I can. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, I can. I mean, I'm I can. filled with self-doubt yeah. every minute of the day. I mean, yeah. and there's no denying that, like, I, I worry. I am a worrier. People on set will tell me, you are the calmest person we've ever seen directing a movie. I'm like, you don't know what my okay, stomach looks like. like. You can't see my insides where I'm dying. But I, I definitely trust that on an innate level, I kind of know how to make movies. Like, I'm not the best filmmaker of all time by any means. I never, I never will be. I'm not, you know, I'm not as good as my heroes. But I know to a certain extent how to make a movie that is functional, and I know how to get the things that matter to me out on the screen. And I can only assume that if someone's asking me, can we put money into your film, or can you adapt this book, they're doing so because they like mm -hmm. those things that I can bring to the table. And it's absolutely right what you think. I mean, I just wanted to say it's wonderful that you think so. Because but so I'm definitely, like, so many I'm dogs. crippled yeah. by self-doubt. Yeah. And that's, that, I've learned to embrace that, too. Like, yeah. I feel like if I was comfortable making a movie, like, if I just, like, was like, mm -hmm. Well, good job, everybody. Let's take a you know, let's go to bed and not have nightmares about you know <laughs> what we're chewing tomorrow. Then I'd probably my movies yeah. would fail somewhere. Yeah. Like I, I I need to have that self doubt because it keeps me on my toes. And I think that's not uncommon. I think mm, most yes. I think most filmmakers would probably say the same thing. There are so many things I want to ask right now, but I think we have um, time for one more song to listen to, and maybe you can also um, choose from because I I don't know what to what to take now. I would I, I was thinking about. Bonnie Prince Billy, because there's this wonderful short film uh, um, that you made with him, but we could also listen to Nick Cave or Beyonce, that's also on your playlist. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I how mean, about you? <laughs> what would be Anna the... van Hauswolf uh, Wolf is also so great. Let's listen to her, because like, yeah. that was, that's something new. I haven't, I've only yeah. known about her for like two yeah. years. Anna van Hauswolf uh, um, from Sweden. I, I met her last year, I think. Young woman with a big church organ, and a lot of church organ she's playing on. She's really great, and it's got this sinister, dark, yeah. beautiful uh, her music. Uh, uh, music. Not this song, but her, yeah. so much of it reminds me of like Lord of the Rings. Like I'm listening to it, and I'm just thinking like... <laughs> mm. <laughs> thinking it's, and it's also a playlist song for the actors, isn't it? Yeah, the song, song is on there as well. Is it okay with you, Anna van Hauswolf? That's great. Track of Time is the name of the song. Yeah. Between that and <laughs> PJ Harvey, you kind of get a sense of the the tempo of this movie, I guess. They're both, they yeah. both have a very same time, similar time signature. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. The tempo of all the songs is quite slow. So um, it, it's so f like um, I. I go running a lot. That's my that's my slowly my thing. running. <laughs> but I listen to music like that when I'm running. Sometimes I want to listen to like Sia or like something mm -hmm. fast and you know upbeat. Mm -hmm. But I love like like we mentioned Bonnie Prince Billy. And one of my favorite memories of listening to his music was like right at like mile 14 of the first marathon I ever run. The song came called Black Captain came on, and just put me at such peace. And listening to something with a slow meditative rhythm and with a gentleness to it while doing something incredibly physical was truly transcendent. And that's something I, in the moments of my life that I hang on to, that's one of them. So Anna von Horswolf may uh, lose her track of time. I don't, and that's why, because I see this uh, big watch over there, I would like to open this conversation for you too, if you want to ask our oh, guest something. Yeah, there was, you was a first hand, but then you, first you. We have a microphone. Hi, uh, congratulations on your uh, work so far. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you, you said about uh, distancing yourself from your emotions. Um, and is that, is that related with working with actors as well? Do you, I mean, do you think your actors are also, do you choose actors that also are more uh, neutral or, uh, you know, um, with their emotions or are they, um, because, you know, if, if there's an emotional piece of music that gives you inspiration but with an actor that is over emotional or, uh, you know, the character is over emotional, maybe you have something very melodramatic or, or you choose, you know. That's a, 
That's a really good question. I think I, if off the top of my head, I've never thought about it like that before, but I do find myself attracted to actors who have a certain taciturn quality or withdrawn quality. Um, and I love getting inside of that. You know, I love my favorite shot that I keep going back to in, in movies is like holding on someone looking out a window for a long period of time. And after a bit of time, you start to get a sense of what's going on in their head and what they're feeling. And that's my, like, I'd rather do that than have a scene of someone just crying profusely and, and laying bare their soul. Um, so I do think that that is, is something that I'm attracted to, even in something like Old Man the Gun, where, where I'm working with Robert Redford, who I think at this point, like, we know him so thoroughly as an actor, like, you just know who Robert Redford is, there's no way to avoid it, but my favorite shot in that movie is one where we just let the cameras roll and kept rolling, and it's a close-up on his face like this, and the camera just keeps rolling, and there's a moment where he just, I think he's, you know, I, I think he stops performing, he's just himself, and and maybe withdraws a little bit, and that is really exciting, because you just all of a sudden see the real him, and it pulls you in a little deeper. Oh, he's a very good actor, and he makes you think that he... <laughs> he, he also, I wouldn't put it past him, like, he, he's the... I've told this story before, so forgive me if you've heard it, but when he, on Pete's Dragon, I, I went up and gave him a note after, like, the first day of shooting with him, and I was like, so great, that was great, but on take two, try it this way, and he's like, I was doing that, you just weren't paying attention, and uh, he was right. <laughs> It's okay with him. <laughs> There was a question in front here, in the first row. And you can also, of course, ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. First, in the first row. Hi there. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about giving playlists to actors. And do you just give them a playlist and say, this is the emotion for the film? Or do you have certain songs for certain scenes? And you say, This is kind of how your character feels at this point, at this scene. This is the song that would be playing in their mind. It's more general than that. I think it's, it's more like here are a series of songs that feel the way the movie is going to feel. Sometimes, like with, with, with Rooney Mara, I've given her characters uh, songs that are specific to her character. Um, and I, I just say, like, this song, for me, speaks to me about who the character is and, and what she fe is feeling. Um, and, you know she has her own ideas, so that's why I think she had her own playlist for, for some of those movies. But um, I, I generally use it more just to kind of convey what the film itself will feel like in totality, and just so that we all understand like that feeling. Sometimes there are specific scenes, like the, the PJ Harvey scene is, if I use it in the movie, it's gonna go, I think, this could all change, but I, I, it would go in a very specific place. Um, and I'll say that, I'll say like this is, This is the feeling we have, like two thirds of the way through the movie, when we get to this point, this song will kick in so that we feel this way about where the character is um, and where the movie is as, on the whole. But it's, it's, it's generally pretty general. And what if somebody, um, some of the actors has a totally different musical upbringing because he or she is older, for example, or come from a different culture and maybe can really not rely to things like PJ Harvey because, I don't know, they listen, their music is swing or something. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I, I haven't had that experience yet where someone doesn't get it, you know, like, or where they're, they bring something else to the table. I mean, I have had actors bring music of their own, and that's a great, you know, the, the, the dialectics of sharing music is really <laughs> exciting for me, um, both in, on set and in life. But I do think that generally the people that I'm, you know, that I gravitate towards inherently end up liking the same things I like. And... And there's never been a case where like an actor is like, I've never heard of any of this music. Like it's usually more, you know, with the, with the film we're about to do, I sent the playlist in to, to an actress and she was like, this is I, one of my favorite artists. Like, I just love this. I'm so glad you included this. And I think that's just because people, you, you, you gravitate towards like-minded people in this, in any right. career, mm -hmm. you just naturally do. Like there's something about someone out there that, and I've seen them on the screen and I'm like, I want to work with that person. I don't know why. And when you meet them, you find out why. And it's usually because you like the same things. You're right. There was a question there on the first uh, floor. I don't know who was raising their arms first. You have a microphone over there, don't we? No. Um, oh, yeah. I have the microphone, so I'll Perfect. go on. Hi. Um, since we're kind of talking around mistakes, yes. Um, I was wondering if during shooting or during editing something maybe not necessarily goes wrong, but kind of doesn't go the way that you're planned. Yep. Um, how do you deal with that? 
um, do you try to hold on to the original idea or are you easy to go, oh, that's fine? So just generally, how do you, you, know, how do you go about that? How do you feel about situations and how do you deal with that? I usually kind of just move with the breeze, I, I would say. Like when things go wrong, I'm, I try to maintain a certain degree of flexibility. Like I go into the movie with as much of a plan as I can. I don't storyboard every shot. I don't like have a, you know, you know, a diagram of exactly how one shot will cut to the next, but I've got a pretty good idea. But I just got really comfortable just, you know, going with the flow on set. And if something positive comes my way, like if I see something that gives me an idea, I will try to capture that. And conversely, if something's going wrong, I try to have enough of an idea of the movie in my subconscious at all times that I can pivot to something different that still allows me to make the movie I set out to make. Without, it's not gonna change anything so drastically. Because I just made Old Man the Gun, well, it's, you know, we shot it two years ago, so it's a little while ago, but the, the most recent example is that one. And there was a whole sequence in that movie where at a certain point I just felt like, this isn't gonna work. Like, this sequence isn't going to work. And um, I, I don't wanna shoot it. Like, I know we're gonna fail. Like, everything is pointing towards failure. And it was an important scene in the script to me, and I'd fought for it and tried to make it happen. And then all of a sudden, like, I just saw the reality coming my way and just realized this sequence will be a disaster and we shouldn't even waste time trying to shoot it. Let's put that time somewhere else. And as soon as I just let go of it, it was great. I was like, I was like all of a sudden we have an extra day to shoot some, to try other things. And, and the movie all of a sudden became clear in my head, like losing that and realizing that it wasn't going to work was a, a godsend. Conversely, on that movie, there was one day where one of the actors, it was Tom Waits, speaking of music, we should listen to some Tom Waits music. Yeah. Tom Waits um, had a shirt that halfway through a scene, I was like, I hate that shirt. <laughs> and that's all I could think of for the rest of the day. Like, all I could think about was, I've got Tom Waits, a hero of mine in my movie, and I've failed him and the potential of him being in my movie by giving him a shirt that... I don't like, and I talked to him about it, he didn't like it either. Can you do something in post-production? Like and something? we were too far, like, I was like, I just like, I couldn't focus on it. Like that day, like all I could think about was like, I fucked up with the shirt. This is a terrible shirt. <laughs> and in post-production, I cut around it. Like, I, like that was the only thing I could do because I did not like it. And, and the scene is much shorter than what we, we, it was a long scene. It's very short in the movie now. And not, that's not just because of the shirt, but like that was the first time where I was like, hit with a mistake mm -hmm. that just monopolized my day and I could not get over it. And it really, like if we had, we were towards the end of the production, there was no time to like start over and shoot that scene again, mm -hmm. but it really just, that ruined like the, there were like two days that we just went downhill because, mm -hmm. and the rest of the scenes at that location, just like always thinking, I was like, man, that shirt was terrible. What was on the shirt? Oh, we're dying here. It is. It's like a shirt with the phases of the moon on it. It's really goofy. With what? The, the, the moon? The phases of the moon, like uh -huh. the full moon, I the see. waning moon. It sounds like goes, nice. <laughs> it's a, it sounds nice, but it... <laughs> Luckily, have... it's like mostly a dark shirt, so we did go in the DI, too, and just like yeah. time down the moon, so you can't really... <laughs> but that, that, was like, that was one that I couldn't deal with. Like, usually I'm very good about just, just going with the flow. If, if a problem arises or we make a mistake, I can just, you know, figure out on the spot a solution, and that one... That one got me. And then you can still cut in the post-production, so we have some solutions already. Yeah, and there, there always are solutions, yeah. but yeah. there's nothing worse than being on set and like you're three scenes down the line still regretting a choice that you made at 9 a.m. that morning. It just, it's not a productive way to work. And I, uh, I will be much more careful in selecting my shirts in the future. Yeah, it goes for everybody. There, was, yeah, there are two questions here, maybe first uh, in the third row and then in... Hello, thank you so far. Thank you. Um, I remember one of the things that mainly blew me away after seeing a ghost story was the score. Uh, and what surprises me in your talk is that you admit that you're actually one of the people that dares to use like temp music and inspire people on forehand by music that you've picked. Then again, when seeing a ghost story, not knowing that, it feel, felt to me like a really original, fresh score with moods that you know caught me in a way that I didn't expect. Um, so how do you approach the composer then, apart from the actors and the other people, 
Um, and you mentioned Hans Zimmer, for example. I know some specific directors that like to work with him, give him some inspiration, then lock him up for two months and just rely to what he comes up with. How do you work with your composer since you're so specific on music? That's the same thing I do. I, I'm very lucky in that I've had a composer that I've worked with since my early short films, and he's done every film to date, and hopefully will do every, every one that I ever do. Daniel Hart. Daniel Hart. Mm -hmm. And he and I just understand each other in a way that allows me to lock him up in a room for two months, as you say, and he comes back with a score, and usually it's, it's the right thing. Like with a ghost story, because we made that movie so quickly, the score was the very last element, and there was only one track in the whole film that um, I asked him to do a second version of. Like, usually he just would send me a track, and I'd be like, well, that nailed it. Drop it into the movie, good to go. Um, and most of our work is like that these days. I think that we've developed like an understanding of, he knows, he can look at my scripts and know what, how I'll shoot them, what the feeling will be, how I'll cut them, all the scenes that I'll probably cut out. And, and he can start thinking very early on what you know, the, the musical tone of the movie will be. And I certainly will give him some jumping off points. You know, for a ghost story, um, I can't remember what I gave him for that. Um, but for The Old Man, The Gun, I was like, I just, let's just make the whole movie percussion, like percussive, like let's have a lot of drums. And that's also, I gave him the score for Local Hero that, hero that Mark Knopfler wrote. And I was like, this feels like the right type of thing. And the movie, ultimately, the score is percussive, but it's not drum-based, and it doesn't sound anything like Local Hero. But nonetheless, like, I know how he got to his score, his final score from those ideas. And, and we don't talk about it that much. It's really one of those luxurious relationships where we don't have to really discuss it in depth. And so I can get, I feel like I'm getting specific with the music just by making the movie. I'm making the movie in a very specific way, and he responds. And I do sometimes take score that he's written for scenes and put them elsewhere in other parts of the movie. Like, I'll be like, this scene's, this music is great. It is, it's not helping the scene that you wrote it for, but if I put it later on, it'll actually, you know, take it to the next level um, in ways that neither of us plan. But, that, but it's really, uh, you know, I kind of just let him run loose with, with the movie when it, it comes time. When I've got that first cut that has no music, I just give that to him and he starts bringing us, bringing us tracks. It's all very lucky in this. Uh, it is, I mean, it is. It's one of those really. Uh, yeah. with, that's why I work with the same people so repeatedly. It's like when you find those relationships where you Keep don't them, have yeah. to communicate as much. You just it makes the whole thing more yeah. magical. There was you were yeah uh, uh, in the middle, bearded guy yeah. Uh, I just want to ask a question specifically about the pie eating scene in a ghost story. Um, our other scene that we prepared because we liked it so much. We yeah. should almost, you have the head scene. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, firstly, was it always intended to be as long as it actually was? Because obviously, at least for me, that lended to how powerful the scene actually yeah. was. And secondly, did you ever experiment with putting music to that scene? No. I, um, I knew it would be long. I didn't know how long. I left that up to Rooney. Um, then the script, it said she eats the entire thing, and I told her, I was like, eat as much as you physically can, and then when you're done, just run to the bathroom, and well, that's the end of the scene. Um, and so I didn't know how long it would be. If she had gone for like a minute, it would have been shorter. Um, it's ultimately broken up into two shots, and the initial plan was it would be one shot, but she came in and was like, I think I would sit down on the floor and so that necessitated a, you know, us, we talked about dollying over, but dollies felt inappropriate for that scene. So we were just like, let's just put a cut in there. And then once we do that shot, we're done with the scene. Like you just take it as far as you want to take it. And, and, and so I knew it would be lengthy. I didn't know how lengthy. It could have gone longer. It could have been shorter. But I just knew, I was like, I just trusted her to take it to the point that it needed to be. That was like a, a tremendous amount of trust on her part to um, trust me to like showcase that. Like that's like something that is like a really... You know, she told me, like, doing scenes like that that are so long, like, you don't have a chance to hide as much. You, every, you're on the entire time. It's more like theater. And you have to be completely honest, and you can't hide from anything, and it's really difficult. And so I was glad that she recognized that and also trusted me to, like, you know, utilize it well in the film. Um, and 
there was never a moment where there would be music in it. Like, the closest we came to underlining at any point was when we discussed, should we include a dolly? Like, should we dolly over? Like, she starts off standing and then, you know, sits down and we would have had to dolly to get to that. Um, and then we were like, oh, and once we've got the dolly track out, should we push in slightly? And then we were like, no, that's inappropriate. Like, let's just, the only thing we should do here is just step back. And, and so, yeah, there was never, never even a hint of, um, discussion of putting score there and even the sound design in that scene there is some sound design going on but some of it's natural like as we we're shooting there was a school nearby and you can hear a kid's playing in the background and that's all that was really there and and um and i mean it was so it would have been so easy to not trust that moment to have the power that i was confident that it would have and so i could have done a dolly shot i could have put music in i could have made it shorter a lot of people told me to make it shorter. They're like, eh, you know, this scene's a little long. Like, maybe you yeah, should... But, but that's the point of the scene. But that's the point of the scene. Yeah. And I was like, this scene, I can watch it. It's five mm -hmm. minutes long. I can watch mm -hmm. it endlessly. I, like, I don't watch my movies. I can't watch them, but I can watch that scene. Mm -hmm. and, and it always gets me. And so I was like, that's the movie's, like, heart right there. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, for me, it's the... It's, it's the, the Transition from eating to numbing in a way. Yes. Not, not, she's not eating anymore because she's hungry. Because it's, it's about something totally it's something different. different. That comes after two or three minutes. So you have to wait until this. But there was a question there up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your uh, editing process? Because I saw that you edited the ghost story yourself, but uh, the other movie you had uh, two editors. So I'm wondering. How, how you do it, and the second question is, how do you approach people who are like older and ex more experienced, like uh, Robert Redford and you know Tom Waits and people like that, because it's always kind of, you know, different. I don't approach them that much differently, but I'm always eager to learn from them. Whether it's, you know, just like, I never would go to Robert Redford and say, well, how would you shoot this scene? Because that's inappropriate. You know, he's there to act, I'm there to direct. But I do want to just, like when he tells me that I wasn't paying attention to something he did on take one, that, I learned from that, you know? And I carry that with me and I, I, I he was right. Um, and, and you learn from like the stories they tell or you learn from just like being around them. Working with Tom Waits was really beautiful because he wanted me to direct him. Well, so did Bob, so did Sissy, but like he was like, he really worked those scenes. He would just like go over the dialogue. He'd be sitting outside the set, just like going over it and going over it and wanted, I figured like, here's a guy who's been performing his, you know, at this point his entire life. He knows how to do it. He could walk in and do this in his sleep. But he had a beautiful lack of confidence that he was looking for me to provide. He wanted me to tell him how to do the scene and, and, and the way, and to guide him towards giving a good performance. And that was, that was really beautiful. And it reminded me that it doesn't matter what age you are, you know, you're always going to be fumbling in the dark when you're doing these things. You get a little bit more confident, you get a little bit more comfortable maybe, but there's always some degree of discomfort because you're putting yourself out there in a way that is, is difficult. When it comes to editing, I could talk all day. We could talk for another three hours about that. Um, I love editing. It's my favorite part of the process. It's really where I feel I'm comfortable. You know, making, on, when I'm on set, I am, like I said, I just feel sick all day. I feel like I'm dying inside. But when I'm editing, it just is alchemy and it's fun. You're trying things out and you have the ability to fail with less pressure. You know, on set, you can do some, you make a decision that will have a ripple effect and you can't really go back. I can't go back and reshoot the shirt that I didn't like. But in the edit, I can go and like try focusing on it a little bit less. And if it doesn't, if I need a little bit more, I'll put a little bit more in. And, and so it's, it's zero stakes. There's some stakes, but it's, it's, they're, they're not as sharp. And it's really where the film comes to be. And I, I love the plasticity of it. I love the temporal aspect of it. I love everything about it. And I also love the collaboration when you're working with an editor who can bring insight to it that you haven't had yourself. You know, like when they bring a fresh pair of eyes, I worked on Old Man the Gun and Pete's Dragon with an editor named uh, Lisa Churgan, who's just wonderful. I just really got along with her um, and had a great time. And on a ghost story, I did it myself because I felt that I couldn't have explained to someone what I was after. It would have just been, because I know how to do it, because I know how to use the software, and I am very quick and very adept at it, and I trust myself as an editor. I was like, this will be faster if I just do it myself. I had. I worked um, with someone a little bit while we were shooting, um, 
to, you know, uh, just to do rough assemblies. And they're like, I just don't know what to make of this footage. Like, the way you're shooting it is so weird, and the takes are so long, and you just can't figure out the rhythm of it. And I was like, it's okay, I'll, I'll figure it out later. The movie I'm about to do now, I'm going to cut again, because I feel it's going to be very similar, and that I just really, I need to go exploring on my own. And even on Old Man the Gun, you know, or Pete's Dragon, I have my own edit suite next to Lisa's, and I don't sit in the room with her while she's cutting. That's my least favorite thing. I want her to just have the room to go exploring on her own and to show me stuff when she feels she's in the right space. And I want to do that myself. Like, there's no way to get to know your footage better than to just sit there and play around with it. I hate watching dailies. Like, I hate, like, sitting there and watching dailies strung out because I just will see things. I'm like, oh, I want to take that moment and that moment and slam them together and see what happens. And, um, and so I need to be able to have that process. I need to be able to do that on my own and, and to, to make those mistakes and to have those discoveries and to, and to, to try things out. Again, fading better. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, editing, editing is a very low... Yeah. It's, it, when you have to deliver the movie, the stakes are high, but yeah. in the moment, you, like, you can just try things and hit undo. It's pretty there incredible. There was another question. Yeah, you, um, yeah, would you give him the microphone? But I would like to, uh, you to get familiar to the idea that we're approaching the end of the thing. I just, you know, so in other words, make it a good don't question. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> yeah. This is the end. Uh, no, um, first I wanted to thank, thank, uh, thank you for a ghost story. Um, I watched on a tiny ass screen on an uh, airplane and uh, cried my eyes out in between two That's, random people. It's made perfectly and, uh, for airplane size. It screens. is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, no, it was a truly profound experience and it changed a lot of my view on cinema, which I just wanted to thank you first. Well, um, thank you. I had two very short questions, which is, uh, you know, very long winded in answers. Uh, the first one is, why did you make a ghost story? And the second one is, can I talk to you after this screening? <laughs> If you can find, I, I um, the answer to the second one is yes, although I have to run and do some interviews, so I yeah. won't have that much time. But um, I made a ghost story because I was having a crisis of faith and confidence and, and just I, I had lost faith in my love of cinema and... And in mankind, I was like making it in, and, you know, made it in 2016, which was like, I just felt like the world was kind of falling apart and both like politically, ideologically, and then also environmentally, I was like really just like terrified of like the fact that I didn't feel like the world would be around for that much longer. And I couldn't see the value in making films. I was like, there's no point to it. Like, this is the only thing I know how to do. And the one thing I know how to do and that I care about is utterly pointless in the face of our imminent destruction. Um, And, and so I wanted, and I also had been making Pete's Dragon at that point for about three years. And I have a very short attention span. And I wanted to just make another movie. I wanted, that's the way I express myself. I wish I could write a song, but I'm not a musician. And so I, I just wanted to make something else quickly. And so the desire to make something quickly and the, all those fears and inner turmoil, turmoil that I was having um, came together with this joke that I had for myself, which was to make a haunted house movie, like a horror film where the ghost is someone in a bed sheet, which I thought was just amusing, and I thought would be a, a fun gag. Um, but somehow that morphed into being something very personally profound and emotional. And I knew that I was going to make The Old Man the Gun, too. Like, by that point, like, I had finished Pete's Dragon. The Old Man the Gun was, like, developed at the same time, and I just made Pete's Dragon at the, you know, um, I, I made it first, but I was writing it concurrently. And I just didn't feel like I could make that movie. I was like, I was like I'm, that movie is going to be a certain type of movie, and it's not purely me. Like, I'm very proud of that movie. I love it, but it's not purely me. Um, it's me trying on a hat and trying to make a cool hat out of a hat that I'm wearing. But a ghost story was something that came out of the need to do something that was purely of myself. And I've done that a few, like St. Nick, my first feature was just me. Pioneer was all about me. And I don't want to be like selfish or like myopic, but I feel like if I'm addressing things that really concern, my, concern me, if I apply that tunnel vision, the movies usually wind up being more universal. And I felt the need to do that. And I also was like, I, I was really, um, I just wanted, yeah, it was just part of it was just the speed. I, was like, I, I thought back to my first feature, St. Nick, that I made for $12,000 in 14 days, and I was like, I want to work at that speed again. I want to make something that quickly and that direct. And we spent a little bit more time and money on a ghost story, but not that much. And, and I think as a result, you know, the, the, there's a purity to it that, you know, I love all my films, but that one has something that the other ones don't. 
Thank you very much. I'm very sorry, but we all have a tight schedule. And let me just say that this talk made me want to make a mixtape for you. Maybe I'm going to make one one day. I would love that. <laughs> my favorite song. I would love that. I, thank I you need so more much. music. Uh, thank you so much for your question. I'm very sorry that we have to stop this, but this is how life is in our day. So thank you very much. And thank you, David, very thank much you. for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.